And then we launched after the seminar, round 12 in 2002, the, the smaller seminar room. Yeah. So please start. Uh, thanks, Julian, for inviting uh, me here. Uh, oh, by the way, I'll be hanging out for two weeks. Um, so just one more thing. So the talk can be as long as uh, 90 minutes, so you can interrupt ask questions. <laughs> so, okay, don't, don't, don't worry. Uh, unless you ask some really nasty question, I'll finish with you. Uh, yeah, so um, this this talk is really uh, based on uh, two works I did with uh, this book. So uh, this work is about uh, electric polarization and Luttinger theorem done with uh, uh, Xue Yang, the student here, and uh, Archman and my colleague Yin Chen uh, at Perimeter. Uh, the other work um, on wild semi metal uh, is done with uh, Anton Burko uh, from Waterloo and uh, her, uh, his student in <coughs> okay. So let me justify a little bit, you know, just to convince you that I, you know, even though I have a long title, I'm not just randomly piling up buzzwords. <laughs> So here's a relation that looks very similar for uh, Fermi liquid and wild uh, metal. So you look at this line, you ignore this, this funny object here. Uh, this is just a uh, familiar Luttinger theorem. So I have a de electric dens uh, electron density, which is microscopically determined, uh, which, and then here I have the uh, Fermi volume of my Fermi, uh, Fermi C. And in usual circumstance, they should be equal. Okay. And you should view um, the density as a UV observable, it's kind of given on, uh, on the lattice scale, you can have kind of potential to reach that. And this uh, Fermi volume, you should really think of it as a uh, generalized notion of an uh, IR anomaly. So if I go to low energy and I only focus on my fermions near Fermi C, uh, near the Fermi surface, um, this is an effective anomaly of the IR field theory. And this additional piece uh, is when I if, I, if the system actually lives on the boundary of a higher dimensional bulk, and if that bulk happens to have some non-trivial electric polarization, uh, then I get a modified, uh, slightly modified version of the uh, electric field. So that's one of the things that I will go in, uh, into more detail. And it turns out a very similar uh, formula uh, also holds for the wild semi metal. Let's say I take the, the most familiar 3 plus 1 uh, wild semi metal. Then the, the corresponding UV observable uh, is basically the Hall conductance uh, of the. Uh, 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 now, now I'm talking about three dimensional systems, so it's really Hall conductance per layer, for example, in, in the Z direction. Okay. And the IR anomaly really comes from suppose I have two wild nodes with the opposite chirality okay, uh, sitting at different momentum points. So this delta QZ is the momentum separation, let's say, in the Z direction um, between the two wild nodes. So that gives you this uh, famous chiral anomaly. Uh, and then if, if they happen to mismatch, that means that uh, my 3 plus 1D system is really sitting on the boundary, like a 4 plus 1D bulk with a whole bunch of uh, characteristics. Um, and both are true even with my interactions, as long as in the IR I have a perfect liquid where it wants to be like. So uh, in case you don't care about formula and so on, here are two physical questions that I will actually be on. Uh, try to answer uh, in this talk. So the first question is, uh, is electric polarization density uh, measurable beyond 1D? If you look at the literature, most of the time you want to talk about measurement of the change of electric polarization over time or over space. Uh, but if I, let's say, just want to measure electric polarization density beyond 1D in an interacting system, it turns out to be a somewhat tricky business. So that's one question I want to uh, address. Uh, the other question in the context of the wild semi metal is that suppose I have uh, a strong electron-electron interaction. interaction. Uh, the question is, can I somehow gap out the wild uh, nodes, which I can't do in a free firm uh, theory, uh, without destroying the structure of the chiral anomaly, whatever that means. So now let me just go into uh, the actual story. So uh, let me start with a trivial example. Oh, it's almost trivial. Let's start here. Um, so the example is our polarization, electric polarization in one plus one d. So it's characterized if I think in terms of response theory, like the integral of the gap matter field. I'm, I'm assuming it's an insulator, of course. 
uh, then I can, uh, assuming a U1 uh, global symmetry, then there is a response that's given by essentially a theta term in 1 plus 1 okay, So that's just EA. Uh, with the coefficients uh, taking continuous value, but periodic. So it can only go from uh, 0 to 1. Um, so this is basically polarization. Well, one way to justify that this being the definition of polarization is to notice that this is basically electric field on the one function. So uh, whatever couples with the electric field should be defined as the polarization. Uh, so in 1 plus 1D, this thing can actually be measured. Well, the Langley experiment, for example, uh, by performing a block spreading, or if you prefer, a large gauge transform. And then there's a very phase associated with that uh, uh, flux spreading, uh, and then that very uh, it works with the of polarization. Can I just ask a base question? Yes. In this equation, you're taking A to be some background yes. gauge field, and yes. then this is a, supposed to take expectation value? Sorry. These uh, are all, all these equations are in expectation value? Uh, uh, this is just a background field, so it's whatever. All right, so you just wrote some weird operator for your background field, so it's there's no operator here. So this is just a number. It's a, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so all the matter field I've been up uh, in, in, in this context. Yeah, so it's a pure response. Is this a term in the action or an operator that you're measuring? Uh, no, this is a term in the effective action after you prepare on that. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the slides earlier? Yes. So, uh, is this formula somehow like anomaly matrix? Oh yeah, it, 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 it is. It is. Uh, see the word of all over. Right. So that say, can I write the ion anomaly tensor of some? Is that written in terms of some background field? Can you be written as some background field in this? Uh, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll okay. do that later. Okay. And then also right hand side then, because they can be non zero. So Yeah, so that, that that's a that's a uh, bulk response term in one dimension higher. So alright. Um, okay. right, so that's a very uh, well established story. Uh, also it has a non trivial effect if I have a boundary if I uh, I'm on an open chain. Uh, the non trivial effect is that it, uh, on the boundary, I basically have a fractional charge. Uh, yes? Yeah, uh, very basic question. So is the polarization, called, can it only be uh, uniform? Can, okay. it de uh, can, it, can the polarization depend on space? Uh, it can. Uh, but in a way that's part of the star story. I'm assuming it's uniform. Uh, but it can actually be uniform. Let, let me hide that. Assuming it's uniform. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll be assuming trans Latin translation symmetry throughout the moment. So that's actually important. Um, so if I have an open boundary, uh, you can basically write this term as uh, as this, and then immediately you see that it's essentially a diff what this tells you is that I have a zero plus one d fractional charge of uh, p x. Uh, p x is, uh, is a fr uh, fractional number. Okay. So that's that's the boundary. Um, so one feature is that I call this a topological term, blah, 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 but uh, there's no quantization. P takes continuous value. And as a result, unless I assume additional symmetry, which I'm not uh, going to do that in this talk, uh, in general, P is not quantized. And it's not protected. Uh, so it turns on some provision here on Hamiltonian, it's going to change. Uh, but still, it's a well-defined as a response and you know, measurable. Quantities, so it's uh, certainly meaningful to talk about that. And before I go into um, further, I go further in the story. Let me comment a little bit about why I put a star here. Um, it's actually not going to be important for, for the rest of the story, but it, it's good to spell it out. Um, so when I write a term like this, I'm in the continuum limit already. So a is a lives in the continuum, and once I'm in the continuum, this term is uniquely defined. There's no ambiguity. Uh, but the story is, turns out to be slightly different on the lattice. Uh, it turns out exactly what, if, if I have a complicated lattice, even if I assume tra translation symmetry, uh, if I have a complicated enough unit cell, for example, 
Um, it turns out this thing is not uniquely de uh, defined, and it's a known fact uh, in the literature. Um, uh, it has to do with how I take the limit, the continuum limit of uh, this uh, capital A gauge field. Uh, in fact, different continuum limits uh, correspond to different actual different value of uh, p. Uh, so in, in, in some very vague sense, it feels like on the lattice or on the continuum, you get different quote unquote classification. Um, but let, let me not uh, actually worry about that subtlety for this uh, for the rest of the talk. So if you worry about this, this is your last chance to yell at me. Sorry. So what do you mean by different class of things? I put a quote unquote, which means I don't actually know what I mean. Um, <laughs> well, the, the the thing is, if you ask what 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 are the topologically non-trivial response in a continuum, there's only one number. Turns out on the lattice. Technically, if you have a large enough unit cell, there are as many different numbers as you want. Are you just talking about how like the SSH chain it matters how you choose the unit cell, whether you call it? it it's related to that. Five. It's related to that. It's just the same. Um, what do you mean? Say it more. So, yeah, the SSH, the SSH chain. And if you take the simple uh, example, there are two different P's you can talk about. In the literature, sometimes it's called P and P2. It has to do with how you take your cell, and uh, or there is a way to combine. There is a specific combination of the two P's that's independent of the uh, unit cell choice, and people prefer to talk about that. So in fact, from the response point of view, there are just different ways to take uh, the continuum limit of capital A. Because uh, yeah, when I say continuum limit, there's a, I'm cheating already, because uh, on the lattice, the A is defined on the lattice, let's say through in some links on the link. So when I take continuum limit, I, I demand A to be slowly varying between different unit cells. But within a unit cell, you can do crazy things. It doesn't really matter. Right? So depending on exactly what it does within a unit cell, how it varies and so on, uh, I actually get different uh, piece. So the usual one people prefer is uh, imagine it's completely uniform in some real space notion. Uh, and then the, that definition of polarization is that choice. But from okay, experimentally that might be the most relevant polarization you can measure. But conceptually there's nothing wrong with uh, taking a slightly crazier uh, profile with the Yeah. So I mean given that everything is on the lattice, why yeah. should I not worry about this? No you should you should. The thing is if you are pro if, if you are if you are probing the response to a specific kind of continuum uh, which, as a response theory, you're free. Uh, then it's meaningful to talk about it. So, 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 so let me assume that I've already uh, had a prescription of how I take the continuum. Then I can start talking about this. Yeah, but different prescription may lead to different results. So this, uh, if there's an ambiguity of a polarization, only is, is integer. Oh uh, uh, no, no, no! It's it's fractional. Fractional part can be ambiguous. Yeah, yeah. So it's really ambiguous. So if there is um if there is some lattice dependent yeah. ambiguity, yeah. then if you start go if you take a more complicated theory yeah. and also start probing something that also depends on the lattice, then you can find that there's some relations that like you know you cannot consistently talk about any value of px and any value of some other you know anomaly if you ever get it, right? Well the uh you know as long as I actually know what my gauge field looks like within the unit cell. These things are perfectly well defined. It's just different pattern of the gauge node within unit cell itself. Uh, and th things like equations like this hold once you actually fix the uh, the profile. Uh, yeah. So do you actually have like electrons in the continuum? Does it help or hurt? No. Uh, well, it it helps. In the, uh, it helps in the sense that experimentalists prefer to measure the uh, electric field that's just uniform in actual real space. And then that gives you a preferred notion of uh, polarization to measure. But if, let's say let's say if you want to measure a response to an electric field at momentum, some integer times g, g being the reciprocal balance factor, then it turns out you're measuring some other g, other p already. So but, but it seems like in that case you can maybe it also hurts you because you can like shift where your unit cell is continuous. Yeah yeah once you once you do that once you do that it starts to depend on the unit cell choice. 
actually didn't get a question. Thanks. I, I just. Yeah, I didn't get a question. What's, what's oh, the, the question was uh, actually being actually starting from the continuum. Right. Turn on, let's say, turn on a lot of potential. Does, does that help? The answer is it helps a little bit. It just makes you worry slightly less. But, uh, yeah. All right. So I assume that's the end of the yelling. <laughs> okay, now let me proceed without worry of worrying about that at all. Now let me ask, uh, what does the story look like in Hydra? Um, so traditionally, oh, there are many things one have, one, uh, people have done. Let me basically summarize. Uh, there are three different things one can do, uh, you can find in the literature. Uh, one is to treat it basically as a one plus one. Treat one dimension as the actual what, what actually matters, and you know, treat the others as some some additional label. label. And then the, the 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 story, you know, this story still holds, uh, except X is uh, well the the other directions you sort of integrate out. Uh, the problem is that you don't get the polarization density. If you let's say measure the very phase from plus threading and so on, uh, for example, in two dimensions you get something like this. You get p x times uh, l y. L being the uh, uh, the length in the y direction, the lattice, uh, and you cannot just de de divide this thing by L y because the whole thing is just divide mod one. Um, so for a fixed size system, that doesn't measure polarization density. The other thing you can do uh, is to define uh, por you don't define polarization, you define the change of polarization, uh, assuming you, you know, imagine turning on. Um, some perturbation, some adiabatically, uh, starting from some trivial state, which you define as having zero polarization. Okay. So divide, imagine an adiabatic process, let's say from zero to t, and then the uh, time integral of the current uh, operator uh, operationally defines the change of uh, polarization. Okay. And the fact that uh, as long as I have the fixed initial and final state, it doesn't really matter which path I go through in the idiopathic process. That's guaranteed by the uh, Feldes quantization. Uh, eventually, it comes from uh, uh, charge quantization. So it's uh, path independent of one. Okay. So this is actually a, pretty, uh, a very good de definition. It works for many body system and so on. Uh, the, only, the slight uh, uh, dis dissatisfaction is that it's not manifestly measurable on its own. Right? It, it's a change uh, of, uh, of quantity. Uh, so it's, uh, let's say if you want to measure it through some kind of linear response, you don't, know how to do, you don't, you don't exactly know how to do it. Uh, the analog is to say, one analog I like to think about is to say entropy is, you can define entropy as an integral of d, uh, dq over t, um, but it will be slightly more satisfactory to, to have something like entropy being a um, And the third thing which people can do, I think historically might have been right from this, is that if I'm having a free Fermion system, then things life is way simpler. Uh, there I can just take the occupied band and calculate the integrated Wilson loop. So, so this uk is the, um, uh, the, the block weight function, and this is the uh, familiar battery connection uh, in the free zone uh, for the occupied band. And if I integrate this guy, it turns out that's the polarization. Any, that works in any dimension. Okay. Uh, of course, the obvious dissatisfaction is that this works for free for me. So I want to go is to understand everything with a reasonably strong fraction. Yes? There's a many body version of this expression. Yeah, with green function. But yeah. No, no, not green function. Uh, in terms of uh, twisted boundary condition. Yeah, I think that has similar issue with this. I think I, if I'm not wrong, uh, if I'm not remembering it wrong, then that gives you key yeah. 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 So, so the nice thing about this is I directly gives you key. If if you deliberate to me, not the sum. So indeed, there is a version of this written as three functions because of. Yeah. Any, any, anything with this, you can convert it to some sort. But a network for interaction system. Yes. But that, that, that's like a result some problem you want to. It does, it, it, it does get better. 
uh, depending, on, depending on how much you like free function. No. Uh, I don't think I've ever done a single thing on the green function. Um, yeah, I think I watched that paper that came out recently where like, he was trying to, to get rid of this L Y this problem not being modified by L Y in terms of like proving L SM or something. Like he has a different twisted round definition to seem to avoid that problem. Yeah, I haven't absorbed that paper yet. So uh, yeah, modulus so so these are everything I listed here are pretty ancient stuff. So. All right, so uh, so now let me let me let me give you the answer, uh, one answer at least. Uh, so actually, it's kind of obvious in hindsight. Uh, so if I want to think about if I want to generalize this integral d a to higher dimension, and I know that somehow I want I care about lattice translation symmetry because if I don't have lattice translation symmetry, I, I don't know what I mean by polarization density, right? Better talk about the actual polarization, uh, the total polarization. Um, so, so then the, the, the natural term to write down that looks something like this. Um, let me explain this x1 or we're going to d. So uh, xi uh, is a z gauge field. It, it's, it's a gauge. It's a probe gauge field that corresponds to the uh, lattice translation symmetry. Let's say in the uh, i direction. Uh, so it's a z uh, gauge field. Uh, and if you look at this term, well. Again, I'm, I, I'm writing down cup here just to avoid any, anyone from yelling at me. But practically, if you're not familiar with that symbol, you just think of it as wedge. Um, so, <clears throat> so you look at this term. So everything here is an integer form. The a is a two pi integer. Uh, these are an integer form. So the whole thing is an integer form. Uh, I, I, uh, it's, it's designed to be a d plus one form. Um, so when I integrate, it gives me an integer, and then I get a coefficient that takes continuous value uh, in, uh, between 0 and 1. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the notion that I can uh, actually think about probing uh, translation symmetry by turning, up, uh, turning on a probe gauge field, if I can, if I, can do, I guess Brian and Dominic's work, uh, they, uh, maybe some hint, hint even earlier. Uh, but in case you're not very familiar with that, let me explain a little bit what this funny translation gauge really is. Uh, first of all, it's, it's a z-gauge field, which means it's locally, well, if you really think, if you want to think of that as a usual gauge field, well, it more or less looks like the usual EM gauge field, except it's locally <laughs> flat, so there's no filter locally. Um, and the only measurable thing are essentially the Wilson loops around the, the, the cycles of your space-time, which takes integer value. Right, this whole thing, I mean, it's very similar, thinking about this term, it's very similar to thinking about point one that you showed before, but you allow the system size. To yes, 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 yes. That's basically it. Um, and in fact, that, that's how it's motivated. Um, so, so let me just explain very brief, briefly what this gauge field does. So uh, just, just like any gauge field, the Wilson, as I said, the, the physically meaningful quantity is the Wilson loop. And for any gauge field, the Wilson loop essentially measures how much, gauge, uh, how much symmetry transform you want to perform after going through a cycle. Uh, and that and you can actually make it quite manifest on the lattice. Suppose you're thinking about some part integral. It doesn't really matter in real, real time or imaginary. And um, you want to impose some kind of periodic boundary condition. Uh, the kind of boundary, periodic boundary condition you want to impose, it turns out it's something like this. Right? So let me explain that with this figure. Suppose I have a 1 plus 1D system right, with a one-dimensional translation. And then, let's say I have a system size of 5. The sixth one is identified to the first one. Then that means this uh, gauge field x has a Wilson loop equal to 5 along the uh, space direction. But I, you can also have a non-trivial uh, Wilson loop uh, along the time direction. That's just a sheet. Uh, this is saying at uh, time t, at uh, time capital t, I identify the system with the, my original one, uh, the t equal to zero one, uh, except with the shift. So things like that. Um, so uh, alternatively, if you really prefer to think about it as a continuous gauge field, 
uh, you can think about in, uh, embedding the Latin system uh, into a continuum. Uh, so, and then you can then this gauge field essentially behaves like the uh, gradient of the uh, uh, position field, uh, which people talk about quite often in the elasticity uh, literature. It's sometimes called the elasticity tetrad. Um, and uh, uh, of course, this is a local uh, formula. It turns out that you can have a different embedding. It doesn't really matter if I shift the real space position of that lattice point a little bit. Uh, that's, that just corresponds to a different gauge choice. Uh, so, so in some sense, this, uh, this gauge field is probing the topological part of the elasticity deformation. Yes, the particle maker of dual the size is com complex. So there's also a bump. No, no, side, side is whatever, whatever field I have. It doesn't mean fermion. It means fermion, bosons, whatever. Yeah, uh, whatever you find the size. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so now let's take this uh, this term and see uh, see if it actually buys us anything. Right? I, I said okay, you find it, but so what? Um, well, it buys us buys us quite a bit. So if I stare at this term. Uh, and uh, let me ask you a question of uh, what does an instant do? Uh, an instant of the charge u1 uh, gauge field, right? So it's a, that, that, that's given by a two cycle on which the dA equals to pi. Right? Um, then you can just plug this into this, uh, this term, and then you read off a lot of the information already. Um, so if you follow the uh, standard procedure, then you see that in 2 plus 1d, then this instant now is a monopole in space time. So it's, it's essentially a two pi flux in space, and then you 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 take this uh, formula, uh, you realize that that's just saying that the monopole actually carries a crystal momentum uh, given by uh, two pi z uh, cross p. Z is the perpendicular uh, direction. So it's a uh, so you get a momentum that's proportional and perpendicular uh, to the polarization. And if you play this game in three plus one d. Uh, you also get a very simple result that's uh, saying the monopole, now in 3 plus 1 the monopole is a non-local object, so it's allowed to transform projectively under the symmetry. And in fact, indeed it does. Um, so the turns out the monopole uh, transforms projectively under the translation. Basically, T, Ti and Tj don't commute by, as a equal to J, uh, according, for example, Tx, Dy don't commute if, they have, if I have a non-trivial non uh, polarization in Z direction. This is a relation acting uh, on a monopole object. Okay. So, um, actually, both results can be uh, interpreted in some very semi classical, almost high school level uh, physics. So, in 2 plus 1d, it, it's really just saying that the momentum, if I have a polarization, so classic, semi classically interpret polarization as some kind of dipole density. If I have a dipole moment, and I turn on a magnetic field, it gets a momentum. Classically, we know that. Uh, now, if you take that seriously, then you know you get a, a dipole density, which is polarization, across the B field. But the B field integrates to two pi, so 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 that's your uh, that's your mo uh, momentum of the monopole. Uh, and in fact, you can you can even take a band structure, whatever favorite band structure you have with low enough symmetry, and try to you know, calculate some stuff, see if, see if it works. Uh, so this is a plot of uh, the calculation from some band structure. The, the exact detail of the band structure doesn't really matter. Um, so two curves, I think this uh, blue dot is calculated from the free, fer fer free fermion uh, Boson loop uh, integration. And the red curve is uh, is a calculation of the monopole momentum. So you literally take your two-dimensional lattice system Putting a two, total two pi flux, spread it uniformly, and then calculate the many body momentum uh, of the whole thing, of the, of the ground state, which you can do because it's later determined. And the two matches quite well. Uh, so, it, so it works. Uh, the and in 3 plus 1d, the, the intuition is also very sim simple. So it's saying that uh, uh, if I have a polarization, from the monopole point of view, it behaves like a magnetic field. It's, it's like a EM duality. Uh, so if I have polarization P, then my, mon my monopole e essentially sees a dual magnetic field uh, that's uh, given by P. So, T so of course, under, uh, under dual magnetic field, T, X, T, Y, is not going to commute. So that's the picture. Uh, uh. Okay. 
So, while, uh, so I'm, I guess I'm answering one of the questions I posted earlier. Yes, polarization is measurable. You just have to do a slightly funny thing. I mean, it's, it's bad news for experimentalists, but okay, who cares? Uh, all right, so uh, uh, that, that was about consequence on, 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 uh, on monopoles. Now, suppose, sorry. imagine now I have a, a, a yes. sorry, going back to the previous uh, formula for the earlier report. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So can you, can you also add more DAs instead? Second half. Oh, okay. uh, actually, maybe five slides or something. Thanks. Can you add more? Sorry? You add more DAs. More DAs. Um, short story, that's why I was saying that. Um, yeah, so now uh, let's think about the bond. Right? I have a topological term. We always want to think about it. Okay. So here, uh, actually, let me maybe to motivate you a little bit more. Um, for the 1 plus 1d story, the boundary is a simple fractional charge. Now that runs into some naive difficulty once you start to go to higher dimension. Because uh, naively, you want to say there's a fractional charge density on the boundary. Uh, but that cannot be correct because uh, it's a tunable thing. Right? A single fraction charge on, on a zero D boundary is not tunable. It can only be changed by an integer. But if I have a, fra a ch fraction charge density in an extended system, then I can just tune that by adding chemical potential on the bond. So, so what do I do there? Um, well, it turns out uh, there is something that you cannot tune. So, uh, well, short answer is the logic theorem violation. But let, let, let me, let me uh, consider a, uh, a simple case. Let me think about a 1 plus 1d boundary of a 2 plus 1d boundary. And let me, okay, so 1 plus 1d boundary, what, what, what could be the bond? Well, the, the simple, simplest answer uh, is so suppose I have a Luttinger liquid. Uh, but since I'm going to consider a normally Luttinger liquid doesn't make a difference compared to Fermi liquids. You can just think of it as free fermion. It doesn't really matter. So, <clears throat> On the boundary, I can have a theory that's described by this action. Let me explain a little bit. So this S, I'm not writing it out explicitly, describes continuum fermions near plus minus kn. Okay, suppose I have some kn. Um, you can write your uh, you know, continuum action, you know, e slash psi, and so on. on this, right? And that's, min I, uh, that's minimally coupled to this A gauge field and the uh, X translation uh, gauge field. Um, and then I also add this background term. The meaning that this A cup X, it's not too hard to convince yourself that this means a, char a background charge density of a uh, row on this one plus one uh, uh, system. And one thing you can notice is that both, both terms are actually not invariant under large gauge transforms of uh, capital A. So this term obviously is not invariant under large gauge transforms. Capital A, unless rho is an integer. Uh, this term is not uh, because of the famous uh, chiral phenomenon. Uh, but you can regroup things a little bit. You can uh, regroup this into this piece uh, and an additional piece. I'm just rewriting rho as you know, 2kf plus rho minus 2kf. Uh, that's a pretty uh, trivial rewriting. Uh, but the statement is uh, this thing under the bracket. Uh, now is uh, uh, invariant under large gauge transform. That's just the famous uh, uh, chiral anomaly matching, uh, also known as the theorem, I guess. Um, saying that this is just saying that if I think about a background density to kf and a uh, Luttinger uh, liquid with uh, kf, then it's invariant under large gauge transform. But then I have the re the rest of the term rho minus two kf over two pi times a cup x. Now there's no hope for making that term. Uh, gauge invariant uh, when this number is uh, is not an integer. Right? There's no uh, continuum fermion to save you uh, from, uh, from uh, gauge non invariance. So now you have no choice but to actually think of it as a term living to one dimension height. It's a 2 plus 1 uh, D term. So you think of that as the boundary of this uh, DA complex term. But this is nothing but the polarization uh, in y direction, as I just talked about, this higher D. So, so from this, you, you get the result that the polarization on the boundary 
doesn't just give you the boundary charge density. It actually gives you the boundary charge density minus a quantum correction. That's just the 2kf uh, uh, of the boundary boundary uh, liquid. So, uh, so the, the, the upshot is uh, polarization doesn't give you boundary fractional charge. It gives you a boundary Bollinger theorem violation. Thank you, Sumi. Uh, so yes. the previous slides, is this rule can be viewed as a background charge from the nucleus? Uh, you can include that. It doesn't hurt because uh, that's supposed to be an integer. Yeah, so you can, you can this, this row can be, in general, any real number. When it's an integer, it's a it's gauging variant. So. Uh, yeah. you, you, you're, you're always free to uh, introduce another background term, which is at some integer times uh, a top x. The, That's fully gauging variant. Let me see what I'm concerned about. It's as a... Okay, let me, let me see. Suppose uh, this uh, nuclear can carry a fractional charge. You know, this background nuclear charge can be fractional. Yeah, so, whether this, so what I try to really try to say that is whether the gauge invariance really come from the, the electron density should equal to nuclear density exactly. So that's a charge neutrality condition. Uh, in fact, the, okay. that, that, yeah, that's my question. Uh, this on, on, the, on the boundary, I don't demand that. In mm -hmm. fact, to, in the bulk, to make this kind of term better defined, I better have something like that. Uh, I, I want charge neutrality. But on the boundary, I don't, I don't, I don't need that. Yeah, so, so, so the, the point is that when you have a charge neutrality condition, it's like a normally free, which can be realized without the bulk. Uh, whether we can interpret that way. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I wouldn't say that's strictly a charge neutrality. Yeah, okay. For, for example, even if uh, polarization is zero, so I don't need the bulk. Yeah, you don't need bulk. Uh, I can still have a non trivial row, it can be any fractional number. Uh, the total total row can be any fractional number. As a result, I get a 2 kf. Yeah, that's not trivial. So so for this uh, for this statement, I don't actually charge neutrality. Overall charge neutrality doesn't play a role. I see. Uh, I'm going to, you know what I thought is that uh, when you have a total exact charge neutrality, yeah. that means you can realize your one plus one d without the bulk. But however, when you have a bulk. The bulk may provide bulk polarization may provide some charge in the boundary, and the boundary still have a charge neutrality. So I can kind of see whether this way of understanding the real result is a well. Okay it's uh, it's okay. one it's one special uh, circumstance. In fact, in fact, you that's one way to say it. Uh, is to say that suppose for some reason uh, you demand rho to be zero on the boundary. Then it's saying the, the IR anomaly, this 2KF, is given completely by the bulk yeah. anomaly. Okay. Yeah. So that's a special sort of, uh, yeah. But in general, it can be more general. So okay. the, the fractional part of the background charge, the, 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 the overall charge also gives you an IR, contributes to the IR. Yeah. So you can, you can do either way. I see. Yeah. And uh, I see. Uh, let me try to see what I'm uh, I, 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 yeah, I can't. Yeah, uh, now, okay, you go to higher dimension. Uh, the, the obvious generalization of Flesinger liquid to higher dimension is the permanent liquid. And uh, thanks to Masaki, I don't have to actually do a separate calculation. Uh, essentially, uh, what he has shown, I mean, in a different language, really, but uh, is that to think about permanent liquid, the only thing I have to do is to replace this 2KF uh, by the Fermi bullet. Okay. Uh, so then you get this relation uh, here. So again, as I said, this row is a UV observable. If you like, it's part of the Hubert space definition. If you really prefer thinking that way. And this uh, VF, you should really think of it as an anomaly indicator of the IR UV. It's a Fermi liquid. Uh, but even if it's not a Fermi liquid, if you get some other thing, FL star or just a T2FT, uh, it's still a defined stuff. It's, a, it's an anomaly indicator of whatever IR. Uh, and then the mismatch is given by the polarization uh, in, a high, in a higher dimension. So that's the modifiers of the linear theorem. Okay, uh, but if I'm in odd space dimension, that's not the only way to generalize a Lullinger liquid. 
Another way to generalize Lodinger liquid is to think about wild metal. After all, Lodinger liquid is simultaneously a Fermi liquid and a wild metal. Because uh, you literally have a left moving, right moving fermion sitting at different levels. Um, so, in, for the Fermi liquid generalization, if I remember for Lodinger liquid, I had a relation like this. And if I want to generalize that, that to Fermi liquid, I just replace this part by you know, the fermions living around. A Fermi surface, and this part by a cup x cup x, uh, sorry, a cup x cup y cup z, blah blah blah, uh, and the rest of the story. Uh, but here, suppose I don't do a cup x cup y cup z. I do it in three plus one. I do a d a cup z. Okay. Um, now that's not charge density, but it's all kind of obvious what it is. Uh, it's the Hall conductance per x y layer. If this is a z. Um, and this part uh, describes now not a Fermi liquid, uh, but a wild semi metal. If you like, uh, so in the, I'm taking the simplest case I have, where I have two wild nodes separated in the in momentum space uh, by delta k. That let's be simple. This is the z direction. Okay. Um, so the, the exact same logic uh, goes through. So there is a specific combination uh, that's gauging, uh, gauging variant because. Of the Anomaly, then the rest of the term, uh, this guy, um, has to live on the boundary of the 4 plus 1 default. So if you care about real life while semi metal for, for which there is no 4 plus 1 default, uh, then this must vanish. So the statement is uh, that for a while semi metal, uh, sigma xy per uh, d direction uh, layer. Um, is given exactly by the momentum separation between the two elements. So this is a well-known statement from band theory. Right? I take two well nodes in, in band structure, then I slice through the momentum space, I get your number one in between, and your number zero outside, so the total whole compactness has to be this number. Uh, but now, suppose I change the game. I say, uh, I introduce interaction. But the interaction is uh, such that in the IR, I still get wild in the metal. That's, that's fine because it's uh, uh, <clears throat> IR irrelevant if it's weak. But in the UV, I say I make it so strong that I cannot talk about band structure. Uh, but it turns out this relation still has to be true. And similarly, there's a version for thermal hall uh, conductance. Well, in this case, it's kind of from a free fermion, you just come from group membranes. Um, but more generally, there's, there's also a similar uh, anomaly matching if you think about coupling it. Yes. So you're talking about the gapless system, right? Yeah. Sorry? You're talking about the gapless system, yes. wild thermals. Yes. So this whole conductance yeah, it's fine. is the, but it's made a subtle, do I need to uh, no, I'm assuming there's no Fermi surface. If I have a Fermi surface it may get start to get tricky. I'm assuming I'm at charge now. I think I think there is uh, things are uh, things are better uh, I have less nasty stuff to worry about. All right, so actually, uh, that's almost the end of the first part. Okay. Uh, okay. I, 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 uh, but you is, is, there any, is, there, is there any questions so far? Because I, I'll, I'll be switching gear. I mean, it's going to be a similar flavor, but it's really switching the gear. So if you have questions, feel free to ask me. Still have 40 minutes. Hopefully, yeah, I won't um, actually use that. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. All right, so uh, let me... Uh, One question. So yes. In, in 2D, I guess, having a finite chart number sort of obstructs yes. defining polarization. Yes, yes. So in higher dimensions, what is what is the, the thing that obstructs defining polarization for... Uh, in 3D, there's nothing. Well, okay. No, no, no. In 3D, if you have... If you still have a whole conductance per layer, that's, that also obstructs uh, the ball defines. The gauging variance. Uh, theta term is okay, but since Simon term somehow is bad. So the, it, it can be analyzed. Well, there are, many, there are multiple ways to analyze that. Uh, so uh, one way to analyze is to think physically about monopoles. And in this language, the reason why in 2D uh, the, mono, uh, the 
for addition is no longer gauging varying because if I have a check, if I have a whole conductance, the monopole is not gauging varying. So its momentum is no longer a gauging variant notion. Uh, and you can you can you can play with this kind of uh, game for 3D and see what term is okay, what term is not. Or you can just play with this term. If I have an in 2D an ADA, then it turns out this XDA uh, coefficient will not be invariant under large gauge transform and so on. So so this for an isolator is just having whole conductivity when one abstracts the, the polarization. Yeah. So it's basically saying that if you have some other anomaly, like a turn science term, sometimes you can absorb this polarization term. It's like yes. a counter term to this. Yes. Yes. Can you maybe elaborate? Yeah. So you're, you're saying that if you have, let's say, just 2D churn insulator, yes. and you, you you do this procedure of smearing flux, yes. and you uh, I guess it carries some charge then? Yes. And you're saying... Uh, so so, so I define polarization as the momentum of this configuration. But now since this carries a net charge, momentum changes if I do it large data. Change it by quantized amount or? Uh, no, if I do a, let's say if I thread a plus, a two pi plus in this direction, that changes the polarization by two pi over it out. So it, essentially you, you can change it by anything. Uh, so if you, uh, and I guess the monopole always breaks translational symmetry. A little bit. A little bit, but in this case it kind of breaks it badly and in the, if there is no whole conductance, it's okay. Yeah. Is that kind of the... yeah that, well, even with whole conductance, the monopole configuration it, it itself still only very mildly breaks translation symmetry. Uh, I mean, the thermodynamic limit that breaking goes away, but uh, yeah, it's more it's more about carrying a net charge. Uh, right? But if I think just in terms of band structure, if I have a two pi plus, the ground state has one extra charge level. Yeah, so so, the, so that's where the thing comes. But in terms, I think in terms of breaking translation, they are as they're equally good or bad, whether you have a channel or not. Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. Since I since I'm trying to, uh, you know, making the notion of what we mean by a chiral anomaly in wild semi-metal more precise, uh, you know, Bernard just as well ask, okay, with strong enough interaction, what can I have? What funny stuff can I have with uh, wild semi-metal? Well, if I have a free wild semi-metal, it's known that it cannot easily be gapped out. I either have to break some symmetry, like breaking translation or the U1 charge conservation, or uh, I'm allowed to continuously bring the two while nodes together in momentum space and then I, but that sort of destroyed the structure of the uh, in the sense that the, the, the whole conductance goes away as well. In an analogy of uh, uh, charge density, let's like say I continuously tune my charge density from let's say one half to zero. Uh, suppose I don't want to do that. Then then we think free fermion is not here. But the question is, uh, it's a question that we ask very often in various kinds of systems, is that can we gap out the wild fermions with uh, sufficiently strong interactions while preserving, preserving all this interesting structure? Yes? So in, in the love and disturb case, there is a microscopic quantity, the charge density, which is, I mean, in principle, it's fixed. I mean, yes. You can add more electrons. Yes. yes. Microscopically, you can choose a particular charge yes. density. Yes. But here it seems like there's no kind of yeah, so, 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 the, so the way I like to think about it there is that suppose for the uh, uh, fractional filling case, you, you, you ensure the, you fix the density by a chemical texture. So that thing you keep tuning. Right? So let's say you're in some parameter. Here is the same. Right? There's some parameter in your Hamiltonian. It might be a complicated parameter, but it's a one parameter thing that tunes the whole conductance. So suppose I want to. Well, the grand model is very natural. Here, yeah, so yeah, it's it's uh it's it's less natural here, I agree. But it, it's a one parameter change. But that's the that's that's all I, I, I can see. Yeah. I guess I'm saying it's slightly 
less natural than the fractional feeling case, but it's not totally simple. It's all right. So, um, yeah, so that's the question. Of course, by definition, if I, get, if I ever get such a state, then I'll get a fractional hole and thermal hole conductance per layer. So that's, that, that's a, by definition, a 3D analog of fractional hole. So, uh, so once I, you know, another way to uh, pose this question, it's really the same question, is that, um, actually, yeah, coming back to uh, Dominic's question. So if I think about a wild cinema metal, I mean, it breaks time reversal symmetry. So if I imagine tuning some parameter that characterizes the level of the strength of uh, time reversal uh, breaking, then I can get, you know, if I pull up the sigma xy, I get something like this. So this plateaus just means some insulator. So this is a trivial insulator, and then I, at some point I start to form wild nodes, and then they separate further and further away, so my sigma xy grows, until at sigma xy equal to one, they actually come back and I reannihilate. I, then I get another insulator, which is basically a stack of integral positive uh, in the z direction. So in between, I get some some curve like this. It doesn't have to be straight. So the question one can ask is, uh, if I have strong inter enough interaction, can, can, I, can I get some, some, some curve like this? Right. Uh, something that's significant on fractional point four. Except here, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strength of T-breaking. It's not a negative T-breaking. Oh, sorry. What does it mean to say the strength of T-breaking? You can use meaning some parameter. Magnetization, yeah, field. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but let me uh, be a little bit clear of the rule of game. Uh, I want to focus on liquid topological orders. Uh, I think the name probably comes from Chilka. Uh So, in the sense that I don't want to consider fractal states. Okay, so I want to consider ordinary three-dimensional topological orders with uh, particles and loops that can move freely uh, in all directions. Uh, so I'm not considering fractals, and in particular, I'm not considering decoupled layers of uh, 2D fractal composite, uh, which, in the, under the risk of annoying the fractal people, I call it type zero fractals. Um, but because uh, if I allow decoupled layers of 2D fractal composite, it would be easy to uh, satisfy with some fractional hole compactness or uh, thermal hole compactness. Uh, so if I have a 3D liquid state, actually that already said, uh, tells me something, because uh, particles can only be bosons or fermions if there's no anion. Uh, and as a consequence, the thermal hole conductance per layer uh, in the natural unit can only be a half integer. Uh, this can be even odd. And, and it can be a odd half integer uh, only when there's a neutral fermion excitation that effectively, effectively forms a stack of uh, P plus I D super. That gives me the uh, uh, thermal hole uh, conductance. And, uh, and that, as I said, well, the cup xy is given by the momentum separation. So that immediately tells you uh, this game can be played only at a specific momentum separation between the wild nodes. If they are half, uh, if they span half of the delta k part. So now, okay, so let, let me play the game. Uh, it's a game that's familiar to many of you, but let me introduce some the, the, the basic stuff first. Um, so to give you some intuition why pi is somehow special. Um, <clears throat> so let me let me start from the the, the, the wild semi-metal and then try to gap out the thing first by breaking the U1 symmetry, just make it this way. That will gap out uh, the uh, the wild semi-metal. But I can only do that by introducing it. Intro, uh, intro node pair. So it's like an FFLO pair. So left pair to that right. right. Um, so this gets out the wild nodes. But then the, the Cooper pairs carry momentum 0 and 2 pi. Well, let me, say, let me take a gauge where the left fermion is sitting at momentum 0 and right fermion is sitting at momentum pi. So the Cooper pair then carries momentum 0 and 2 pi. And 2 pi is 0. So the Cooper pairs are uh, trivial under translation system. So condensing that doesn't break translation symmetry. That's all, that's all I have to say. Okay. So I get a gap state without, with, with translation symmetry, but just you know, breaking U1 symmetry. 
Uh, so I want to recover U1 symmetry somehow to get an insulator. Uh, so a, uh, a very powerful uh, ploy, uh, a very powerful uh, trick one can try to do is to uh, imagine a scenario, a scenario where the superconductor is strongly fluctuating, so the vortex loops, now in 3D these are loops, uh, they pro proliferate, they effectively condense. If I do that, I will have uh, 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 the phase coherence is lost, and then I recover an insulator uh, with full switch. Okay. So this has been a powerful tool to problems like 2D, uh, the, the, the surface of the, uh, of the ordinary 3D uh, topological insulator. So my game here is to play that, uh, to, to do that uh, in previous one. So, um, so if I have an ordinary superconductor, I just condense the vortex and then get a trivial insulator. But that's the end of the game. Uh, but here, the difference is that not all vortices are trivial. Um, so just like when you condense a particle, like object, if you don't want to mess up the symmetry, you, you better ensure that the particle transforms trivially under that symmetry. Same with loops. So you want to ensure that whatever vortex loop I'm condensing transforms trivially under translated symmetry. I don't want to screw that up. Um, so how do I detect the quantum number under translation symmetry of the loop? Well, the modern tool is to actually link that vortex loop with the defect of the translation symmetry. But what's it the defect of that? Well, that's just a dislocation. So it's a, it's a line, in 3D, that's a line defect, which basically inserts a half xy plane into my system. Uh, that's, that's the defect. And then I consider a, 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 a configuration where a vortex loop is linked with this, uh, this uh, defect line and see if any, some funny thing happens. Okay. If there's some funny thing happens, then this vortex is considered non trivial on the translation symmetry, then I better not touch it. I don't, I don't think that is such a vortex. So it turns out for the, uh, for the superconductor you get from the wild, the bell pairing, uh, the single vortex traps in my run at zero mode. When they link with uh, such a dislocation. Yes? Yes. Hey, can you remind us uh, if you just have a single vortex, then in the core, w w what is it? Is it uh, uh, non chiral C equal one half? Or? Yes, yes. That, that, in the core, if, if you're lining straight in the z direction, uh, you get a chiral, uh, sorry, you get a helical Majorana. Sorry. Yes, you get a helical. Yeah, you get a helical Majorana. Yes. Then when you pair condense, you have, I guess, can you remind us what the microscopic, what, what the symmetries essentially are in the field theory? Is it like U1 cross V2 or U1 cross Z4 or Z2 or something? Wow, there, there are a lot of symmetries. So which well, you U1 are you track, You are keeping track of particle number conservation and translation. Yes. And translations essentially access some C2 or Z4 or something like that. Uh, in this case, it's, it access Z2. Uh, so U1 is already broken uh, in the superconductor. So effectively, it looks like there's a Z2 left. My, my run, uh, so, 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 sorry, while nodes live at pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, is that where they are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or 0 and pi over 2. So oh, that doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so the symmetry is like U1 cross Z2. Definitely. Yeah, but the, well, I claim it's better to still remember that as Z. It turns out the story will be different if it's honestly to uh, the nominee will be different. Yeah. Uh, but maybe from the field, the field theory kind of doesn't know. Uh, the, the IR field theory doesn't know. Yeah. But uh, I'm starting to mess up with vortices and so on. It's better to keep them. Yeah, it, it, it's a bit subtle, I agree, but the. Um, I like everything should work in the field for Z2, it's just that eventually if you want to interpret it as Z anomaly, you should just pull it back to the logic group. I, I, I think if you want to start uh, thinking about Z2 becoming Z, then it's kind of a big, you go far away from the field. Yeah, it, well, the, 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 the thing is, uh, thinking about the Z as Z2 is, um, that has two problems. Uh, one is, uh, in fact, I get, I get a different structure of this uh, vortices. So um, if, if I think of it as Z, the anomaly in the vortex vanishes at the fourfold vortex level. But if I think of it as Z2, it vanishes only at any point. <laughs> Which means that if, I, if, I'm, if I'm honest, I should be able to condense fourfold. Uh, 
but maybe only with a strong interaction. Yeah. So, so, so the interaction somehow has to touch UV. Yeah, so I think that's what Max is saying. You have to tune far enough away from the field theory to see this. Yeah, yeah. OK, that, that, that I agree. Yeah. Right, so all right, single vortex, might run a zero mode, so don't kind of it. Um, what about double vortex? Well, sorry, yes. So for run a zero mode here, you mean you run some of the loops in one plus one, one plus one dimensional. Uh, if you have such a link, there's only just a single my run. Single run, there's, there's nothing on it. But if you have a straight line in the z direction, so you keep, you actually keep the z translation, uh, then you, essentially you get this my run mode start to be mobile, and they form a gap here for my run. That, that, that's another way to say um, single vortex kind of context. But so this vortex link Vortex must be created by at least two open, right? Yeah. You can have a single one. Yeah. Uh, and also earlier when you introduced this. Well, sorry, system. sorry. You, you, you can. What happens is uh, because, okay, I lied a little bit. So on this uh, dislocation line, there is actually a chiral one run. So if you, let's say, pass a vortex through the uh, that, domain, uh, that, 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 that dislocation, you actually create two zero one. one Within on, on the on the dislocation line, so 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 a single link is okay, but my run zero mode, of course, only appears. I'm so sorry. So yeah. where are the pair of uh, run zero modes associated? Why here? Why here? Okay. So yeah. So now okay. What about twofold vortex? Well, there's no my run zero mode anymore. Um, but it turns out it's still not trivial. So if I have two such uh, two-fold vortices linked to the same dislocation line, then you can convince yourself that it turns out they have a semion statistics between these two. So this is uh, I mean, this kind of gradient process was first discussed by uh, Chen Jie and Michael Levin. Um, so you, in case you're not familiar, the, the, the two vortices linked to a common dislocation line and then you shrink one and you know to make it go through the other, you expand it and then come back. That gives way uh, a pretty fix. Um, turns out for, for the two-fold vortex in this specific context, that's the same. You get minus one. Yes. So here you have one uh, Dirac moving right, one Dirac moving left, and the right mover is charged under translation, and left mover is neutral. Yeah. So uh, can I just decorate the one the Wire with uh, uh, with uh, if I have a one D wire where the right the right mover is at zero, the left mover is at five, or vice versa. Yeah. Can I just decorate that on uh, on the vortex loops and get them out that way? Uh no, these vortex loops are already gapped. This, these are two-fold vortex. Solve the, no, you solve the equation there. There's no gap. Just no. Why? I thought, I thought well, in, in the previous case, you had two Majoranas, right? Yeah. One was left moving, one was right yeah. moving. The right moving Majorana was charged under translation. Left moving was neutral, maybe? Yeah. So now you have two, so you have Iraq, so, so now you well, then, okay, yeah, that, that's that's the difference between Z2 and Z. So so if it's Z2, then that structure is still there. It's still gapless. So, but when it's Z, I think, um, when it's Z, it, it, it's like having, you know, two wild fermions, e one plus one, one left, one right. The right one has momentum pi, but there's no e one charge conservation. So that thing, you can gap, gap out everything without messing up the symmetry. Uh, unlike the Z two case, for example. so 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 that's why I said this for this two fold forces. You look at whether it's gap or gap or center. I think it's gap. The 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 solidly only shows up when you have only things like this. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's very different from Z two. For Z two, what you said. Uh, 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 so there, yeah. 
I missed something earlier. So yeah. you, you try to get the value semi-metal nodes, and then you introduce some pairing terms, which pair left and left, right and right, right? And they carry momentum. So, yeah. so is there some constraint on the momentum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, want, I want the momentum to be high. So I want the total, I want the Cooper pair to have momentum should be yeah. Otherwise, I'm breaking the yeah. It's only zero and high. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I guarantee you get gap the gap the nodes. No, that, that 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 guarantees that when you gap out the nodes with this kind of pairing, it doesn't break translation symmetry. But you know you you will gap. It. Oh yeah, you, you just you, you literally solve solve the spectrum of this thing. Yeah. Um, yes. Is there something about angle momentum of those modes? Maybe. Yeah, I'm not worrying about that. But if you worry about that, there might be some additional feature. Yeah. Um, I'm not. They wrote that paper together, right? Like yeah. 2000, whatever. Yes. So, uh, yeah, somehow I just decided not to worry about it here. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily just a fun thing. Yeah. yeah. Which paper? Oh, uh, with uh, Drew Potter and uh, Ashman. Um, it's also about uh, getting some gap phase out of the 3D. Uh, it, it, it's actually the the symmetry anomaly is the O2 version of the Witten anomaly. So if you break the SU2, the Witten anomaly down to O2, it turns out that might should be able to get a topological order that saturates that anomaly. Mm -hmm. yeah. But exactly what kind of topological order, how to get that, we had we some pain back then. Getting to but you also need that kind of pairing, this. No, we, we, we did. Uh, yeah, well, I think we also did this. Yeah, 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 we did, we did, we did this. We probably didn't didn't include that in the paper, but we, I think we yeah, did. I don't even remember if we included that. Let, let, let's check. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So two fold vortex is not trivial. Um, so don't condense it. Um, then it turns out four fold vortex is fine. You just condense it. There's nothing funny about that. Uh, and then you get a, you don't get a trivial insulator, you get a Z4 topological order. So the content is, uh, well, you get some particles, you get charge neutral fermions, that's the remnant of the Bogolyubo uh, particle in the, in the superconductor, and then you get, you get a bunch of charge one half photons as a result of a uh, whole vortex constant. Uh, and then you get loose, that's the remnant of the uncondensed one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three fold vortices. And they inherit what non trivial properties of this. Uh, Uncondensed vortices. Uh, and of course, you get the standard particle loop rating. You take an F fermion, the, the, this uh, available fermion around a one fold vortex, then you get a high flux. So those are standard for uh, any Z4 topological order in the uh, previous one. But slightly less standard is uh, uh, this, uh, as I said, this uh, one fold vortex loop that, you know, well, and the two fold vortex loop that. Uh, uh, Carries non-trivial statistics when linked with the, with the dislocation line, and in fact, the topological order is very similar to the five half uh, states. And actually, since Max is here, it's it's basically the same as the Fafian plus anti semion except some of the particles show up only as links between vortices. Show up as sorry. It's basically the same as the Fafian plus anti semion uh, except some of the Particles there show up only as links between loops and uh, dislocations. Otherwise, it looks the same. In fact, the argument is basically the same. All right, so that's the end of my story. Uh, to, summarize, uh, to summarize, polarization is measurable. Uh, if you have a monopole or if you have a boundary, you get a modified Dunning theorem. And uh, there's uh, quite a bit of fun you can have with uh, wild sim metal if you have enough uh, interactions. So, uh, thank you. Thank, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, just a very basic question. It's like, what type of interaction do you requ require to get this? Some local thing. That's it has to be local, like Coulomb interaction cannot give you. Oh, uh, I don't know. The Coulomb is mildly non-local, so the, 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 the thing is, whatever these things are, it's always easy, 
it's always easy if you have arbitrary non-local polynomial. You can stabilize whatever. Uh, in fact, there has been discussion that in Wilson, if you make interactions sufficiently non-local, you can even gap out the thing without having any local. All right. So, yeah, Coulomb, exactly how non-local that is, it is on this purpose, I don't know. Yeah, I don't quite understand the argument about uh, the kappa xy equal one half. Uh, uh, well, that's basically okay. The free fermion version is with my friends, of course, but the 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 interactive version is basically this thing except it's R which R. No, no, no. Uh, the, the argument that uh, you need. The, the, the oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, uh, this thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's saying, okay, it's an assumption. I don't have a proof. Uh, I'm assuming that any kappa xy has to come from the particle forming something. Some short engine handles it. Right. Uh, and if that assumption is true, then then this is not true. But that's an assumption. Yes, thanks for the question. Because uh, then... Uh... Suppose you started with, uh, you know, your while nodes not at 0 and pi, yeah. right? Then it will tell you that if you think of that as some discrete symmetry like Zn, so then, then saying like Zn cross U1 has an anomaly that cannot be uh, trivialized actually, by, by gapping. Uh, yeah, that, that's part of the reason why, why, why I feel hesitant to think about it as Zn or Z2 or whatever. Well, one thing is how... One of the feature in, for the at least for the pi separation case is that this uh, this location line they carry chiral chiral, so so that's literally z. U. Doesn't matter how many copies of it you stack, it's not true. So if you replace z by z two or z n or whatever, you you lose that feature on, on the on the event construction. But we have examples where uh, say like you study a domain wall and you have. Uh, this could be a Z2 domain law with a chiral mode. No contradiction. Oh, uh, is that a unitary Z2 domain law? Uh, you can... For, for anti-unitary or reflection, you that, that, that's imaginable. But, uh, but for unitary... It's still a Z2, that, or like a finite anomaly goes to a Z anomaly. Yeah. So this argument doesn't really work. If you have an example with unitary Z2, I, I, I will find it. I'm yeah. sure you can in that one. Yeah, okay, then, then I need to think about it. But uh, actually, I don't see how... I mean, this dislocation then is somehow outside of the field theory description? I mean, it's a Z. The symmetry is Z. That's the thing, right? I, 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 I think one thing is uh, I have to take that Z instead of Zn to, to whatever n to whatever limit. The, the distinction somehow matters, I think. But, uh, do you understand how to describe the dislocation in the field theory? Then oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it? uh, it's actually just a defect of this z-gauge It's a it's a z-gauge view, so the the, the the defect, let's say, if I, have, if I make a puncture and I count the Wilson loop around that puncture, uh, that's the... No, no, I, I mean in the, just in the wild form of field theory. Uh, sorry, there... Well, what, what, what's your question? Is there a sort of the field minimal theory, coupling? The somehow the field theory is only knows, only thinks of the symmetry as Z2. But yes. then you're saying that dislocations have a chiral mode, so... Yeah. So... Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, because uh, that in some sense comes from the background term. Right. So, so there is a background, okay. In this case, there is a background term of... Uh, R wedge R, you know, or, or, or a gravitational transcendence of Z. Um, that's on top of the uh, wild second, the, the wild fermion. So it, it really comes from UV, if you like. It comes from the, if you like, the, 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 the bands uh, fermion us away from the wild fermion. So that's contributing to this uh, chiral mode. But on the other hand, that, 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 that term is sort of required, otherwise this, this wild fermion mode has, a, has some anomaly that's not matched. So you can say it comes from UV, but it's demanded by the IR. Yeah. Can you 
you should have said that you say something about the top here, the state. Oh. So, yeah. How, how about find out other, other type of popping, like in type popping or particle popping? Yeah, that's the thing. It's, um, so this is a specific type of Fabian, yeah, correct? Actually, as I mentioned, it's Fabian plus anti -Samia. So if you take some other variants, for example, you can let's say you can say, okay, I just want to take sigma equal to cover to one half. Why why don't I just stack a bunch of T Fabian? That would be good. But the thing is, uh, once after you do that, it's hard to get an honest three D ordinary topological order. Most likely, you get a fractal. Now you have to know exactly how to turn on some interlayer condensate to combine the topological order from a huge degeneracy to just order one degeneracy. It's without messing up any symmetry. So if I just give you randomly a topological order, you may not be able to. So somehow for the Fabian plus anti semi you can't you can do that. But for T Fabian, it's not obvious at all. Yes? Yeah, this transition from one outside metal to the this Z4 topology order. Yeah. That's a continuous transition of uh, I mean, is that we, possible or it has to be possible? I mean, okay. Well, I, can, uh, I guess I can never make the statement that continuous transitions is impossible. Uh -huh. But it's just very hard for me to imagine. I mean, in this construction, I need a two-step. I need to, I need to break. I see. Uh, you want symmetry first, and then try to restore it with order compensation. Right, that's a two-step process. Uh, the question is, could that, could I, can I collapse the yeah. two-step to one? That's a highly non-trivial question usually. Uh, it, there, there, there were similar examples in 2D where I, you know, we'll have some two self construction, and then numerically people seem to find one continuous transition. So we're still banging our head on exactly what's going on there. Uh, okay. So, yeah. any more questions? Um, so, how does the surface theory look like? Sorry, the surface theory uh, in like the wild case. Yeah, in the three D case. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, you're asking where 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 does the Fermi arc go? Yeah. Or yeah. So there you have like a really two D surface. Uh, or no, there like there, there you still have some feature on the surface. Uh, so there, okay. For this theory, the surface has a charge mode and a neutral mode. The neutral mode really comes from this uh, adjective of superconductor. So if I have delta k root pi, and I have a pairing, it turns out the surface Fermi arc becomes a Majorana arc. There's no transitions. So, but after condensing, what happens? But after condensing vortices, the Majorana arc stays, but then you have additional charge mode. But their dynamics is quite non trivial. So, the way I know how to describe them is some couple of Luttinger liquids. But exactly what does that Luttinger liquid go to in the IR? I'm, there might not, may not be a universal answer. So, it's a pretty complicated. Is there already gapped? Sorry? Uh, it, it must be gapped. You have some non-trivial sigma x y and top x y so boundary has no there is no change. Did you go set up? The gauge field over a bit is the puzzle for the number of the story for this time. I haven't thought about that. Any further questions? No, this thing is sold for the very nice. Thanks for staying this late. We actually have a lunch just after the, the, the smoker seminar. Feel free to stay.